we're reviewing um, Biblical Unitarian's position on uh, Trinity, on um, this verse in Psalm 110, verse 1, and I'm highlighting what I understand is a summary of how they um, are presenting the material. Point number five, this is in their voice, in their uh, thought process. They believe that the best Hebrew lexicons and concordances recognize this distinction between Adoni and Adonai. And we're going to go there eventually, so just hang on in case you're confused what those two terms mean. Point number six of 12 points that I put together here, uh, summarizing what they have to say. According to uh, Biblical Unitarian, in all its 195 occurrences in the Old Testament, Adoni refers to a superior who is human or occasionally angelic, but never God. That's their understanding of the uh, discussion. Point number seven. Their position is that this distinction provides strong evidence that the Messiah is not God, but a supremely exalted man. And I give them that part where, remember, as I interject, according to the Trinitarian model of God's nature, Jesus is truly God and truly man. He's fully God and fully man, or he's 100% God and 100% man. So he has dual nature. In the incarnation that we Trinitarians affirm, <laughs> We don't have a problem recognizing passages in the Tanakh as well as the Apostolic Scriptures that highlight the humanity of the Messiah because we realize that, it, that he is human. What we disagree is that that's all that the Bible teaches and or that it's the final word. Understand the difference there? We don't believe that those passages in the Bible that are um, describing the human Messiah are the final word or all that there is in the matter. We know that there's more there that God is going to reveal in the pages of the Apostle Scriptures as the Incarnation was um, penned by the writers who actually experienced the Incarnation at the time that Yeshua walked and talked to here on planet Earth, right? Remember, the writers of the Apostle Scriptures are what we might call experiential Trinitarians. What does that mean? Listen up very, very carefully, because this is a charge that non-Trinitarians uh, uh, try to level against we Trinitarians often, and yet their logic is faulty. Often, non-Trinitarians like to tell us that the original writers of the Tanakh could not have been Trinitarians, and the proof is in their writings, and therefore, since the original writers of the, of the Tanakh were not Trinitarians, then we, as modern-day Christians, should not be Trinitarians either. Right? They also fill in the missing gap by saying, since the writers of the Tanakh, a.k.a. the Old Testament, were not Trinitarians, then this proves that the writers of the New Testament, who use the Old Testament as their authoritative uh, body of scriptures, this proves that they too were not Trinitarian writers or Trinitarian disciples of God, because the only body of literature that they, the New Testament uh, writers, the only body of, new t of writings that they had to draw from authoritatively was the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and we already know that it is a non-Trinitarian document. So therefore, that is the um, case that the non-Trinitarian builds against the Trinitarian by saying, hey, why are you Trinitarians, you modern Christian Trinitarians, why are you um, supposing that the um, uh, first century apostolic writers, the new, the first century New Testament writers. Why are you, why are you trying to um, uh, say that they are Trinitarians? Nope, they weren't. They're, they were uh, Unitarian. They were Unitarians, or uh, they were monotheists, or etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, here's the um, weakness of the argument. It is true that the first part of the Bible, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, was written with the mystery of the uh, Trinity in mind. God was hiding the Incarnation in its fullness till a later date. Therefore, all of the revelation was not given. That's what we mean by biblical mystery. God knew the truth. It existed to God, but it didn't it wasn't articulated to human beings, even the prophets. It was hinted at here and there, and there were types and shadows with, you know, with the angel of the Lord and the uh, the theophanies and the Christophanies and the, uh, uh, the 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 captain of the Lord's hosts and and all of these these anthropomorphic um, terminology that was given in the Old Testament to describe God having hands and feet and and appearing as a human being in Genesis chapter eighteen before Abraham, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
all of that was prepping God's people to receive incarnation and Trinity. But it is true that the Old Testament slash Tanakh really is a, a a book that's not primarily Trinitarian in that scope. It's it's Mysterian, right? It's it's God was giving it a mystery. But here's where the um, non-Trinitarian uh, um, discussion goes sideways, goes south, because they fail to realize that. The New Testament writers, even though they were dealing with Old Testament literature that was mystery, that had God veiled in mystery, when Jesus hit the scene, they were experiencing the incarnation of God, and therefore when they later penned what they wrote in the Apostolic Scriptures, the AK, the New Testament, they were writing out of their own experience as, you ready for it? Trinitarians. Thus, they were experiential Trinitarians. That's the point I'm trying to make. They were writing from their experience of walking and talking with God incarnate and uh, understanding uh, Yeshua. And remember, not everything that Yeshua spoke to them, revealed to them, was even written down. But what is written down is enough for us to come to the conclusion that God is mysterious. He's not just a single person, that he's complex in his nature. And that Jesus was very God veiled in flesh, the Word made flesh, God walking among us, and that the Holy Spirit is a is fully God and yet is a person of God, an agent of God that can be dispatched. So let's keep reading. Biblical Trinitarian's um, position, as summarized by my bullet point number eight here, reads, The Greek translation of the Hebrew text in the Septuagint also supports the interpretation of Adoni as a human lord. This is the biblical Trinitarian, a biblical Unitarian, non-Trinitarian model. Let me look at my time and see how I'm doing. Okay, I'm doing great. About five more minutes left in the study. We'll easily finish through these 12 bullet points and be poised, ready to begin to look at some Trinitarian resources, starting with that ubiquitous resource, that infamous resource, Wikipedia. Yeah, all right. Uh, point number nine, we're summarizing the biblical, Trini biblical Unitarian position. When dealing with Psalm 110, verse 1, which is quoted in the New Testament, they teach that the distinction between Adoni and Adonai is maintained. Remember, this is their position, which I've said this in the past. I'll say it again, but very, very briefly this time. You can go back and listen to my previous studies to hear me articulate it in long and drawn-out fashion. Biblical Unitarian brings a lot of truth to this discussion when they're talking about um, some of the traditions of Adoni and Adonai and the Hebrew terminology and the way it gets carried over into the Greek as uh, kurios and tokuriomu and etc. etc. They're bringing a lot of truth to discussion, which is why I respect their um, their opinion and their um, uh, uh, discussion on the matter. Uh, they're bringing a lot of truth. They're not just fabricating things and making up information. They're not what we might call in terms of, of, of AI uh, large language models terminology. They're not hallucinating. They're not making up facts like uh, ChatGPT does when you ask it a question and he spits out details that don't really exist. We say that ChatGPT is hallucinating. Well, that's not what's going on right now with, uh, with um, Biblical Unitarian. Instead, the um, logical fallacy that they're committing is simply that they're leaving out information. It's that they're presenting an e a certain amount of truth, but it's only half the story. That's the point I'm trying to make. And, and to that respect... Um, it's both a blessing and a curse. I'm glad they're bringing a certain amount of truth, but I'm disappointed in the fact that they're not telling the whole story, and in so doing, leaving off copious amount of details that would otherwise um, lead the individual to the conclusion that um, God, in fact, is Trinity. So, um, what do they say in point number 10? The New Testament renders Adonai as my Lord and Adonai as the Lord. Right? That's They're going to bring out some details that, yes, they're giving us some truth, but... Um, the reason that we Trinitarians differ with what they're saying is because we're begging them to complete the picture, fill out the rest of the details. Don't stop with the Old Testament and the Tanakh. Keep going through the Apostolic Scriptures. Point number 11, um, and we're going to draw our study to a close <clears throat> with these points, just uh, really getting into my own reputation. Point number 11, this is according to the voice of um, Biblical Unitarian. This demonstrates that the difference, right, we're talking about what the New Testament brings to the table as far as Adonai and Adonai. This demonstrates that the difference between the two words that was recognized in the Greek, 
translations before the valid points were added to the Hebrew text. And so they're recognizing that the original Hebrew was written without vowel markings, and then the Greek came along and inserted translations from the unpointed Hebrew into Greek, and then later on, the Hebrew itself became pointed. So historically, we're looking at from a timeline from uh, in the correct chronolo chronological order. Originally, we had Hebrew that was unpointed. I'll show you examples of this on the screen in post-production. We have unpointed Hebrew script. And then next came along um, the Greek translations from the unpointed script, unpointed Hebrew. And then later on in history, even after the first century, so later on, I believe in the fourth century, we then ended up with the little vowel points around the Hebrew script. That's what they're recognizing and then just highlighting. And then their final um, point that I've uh, summarized and distilled and created into bullet points, these 12 bullet points, is speaking from their position, they teach that thus Psalm 110 verse 1 affirms the human lordship of the Messiah, not his divinity. So, if they only stated it as Psalm 110 verse 1 affirms the human lordship of the Messiah, I could kind of run with some of that, because that is true that Psalm 110 affirms uh, uh, Yeshua's rulership, and since Yeshua is uh, truly human, 100% human as well, then I can affirm that Psalm 110 speaking of Yeshua is uh, affirming his um, humanity as well. But the part where I disagree strongly is that last sentence, not his divinity. Okay, I disagree there. Again, this is Biblical Unitarians' way of reading into the script, like they are fond of doing it with the Shema, which reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Notice in the Shema, as is represented in the English translation that I just quoted there, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. It doesn't say anything about his nature or his personhood. Did you notice that? Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. What is it saying when it says one? The word Echad, and I'm closing with this. Um, the context, I believe, is in reference to God's um, uh, relationship to Israel as the sole uh, deity that they are to worship, the sole Savior and ultimately Creator, the one who rescued them out of Egypt, the one who bring, brought them to the foot of Sinai and gave them His words, the one that they are entering into a marriage relationship with. He is the single unique partner with Israel in this marriage covenant relationship. Here, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one, using the marriage language, the Lord, the God, the Lord is one husband to you. So we could fill in with the Lord our God, the Lord is one God, the Lord our, the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one um, uh, uh, deity, the Lord our God, the Lord is one being, the Lord our God, the Lord is one that is this, the single unique God above all gods. He's the single soul um, recognized supreme power. There are lesser um, people on earth, and there are angels and other um, types of spirit beings that exist in the world that the Bible recognizes. But here, O Israel, listen up. There's one unique God who created everything. Okay, he is the he is in the unique position above all others, and what is that position? He is God. He is Creator. He's Savior. He's the only one you are to recognize with this label of God. So here is the Lord of God. The Lord is one. The word God that we're supplying by context is the best word to fill in there. Here is the Lord of God. The Lord is one God. But what Biblical Unitarian does, and I'm saying this in closing as I'm drawing to a close tonight, what Biblical Unitarian does is they insert this discussion about personhood and identity instead of nature and God's sole existence as a single God. They insert this argument about identity, I'm sorry, about personhood by saying, by imagining that what the Shema is really saying is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one person. Did you hear it? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one person. That's their supposition. But that's just it. That's eisegesis reading into the text. It's their own uh, supposition. They're hallucinating. So, with that being said, let's draw this part of our study to a close. What we're going to be begin to do next week is I'm going to start jumping through some um, resources, starting with um, Psalm 110 is seen through the lens of Wikipedia. Yeah, why not? Wikipedia may not be the most trusted resource on the planet, but they're somewhere in the middle. They're, they have just enough information to be dangerous. Um, one of their strengths, I believe, is the fact that they are um, crowdsourced. 
crowd crowd resourced they bring um, lots of information from different um, viewpoints so that no one person is monopolizing the conversation and in so doing because of the eclectic nature of bringing on many different resources they have the advantage of of what we might say is a committee discussion and it strengthens a lot of what they have to say because um, it eliminates the um, uh, what we might call the um, bias that's sometimes inherent in having only one person um, wield the discussion. It's almost like having a bipartisan discussion using political terms. If we can bring both parties to the table in a bipartisan manner, we have a strength in having both parties being represented, and we, we can better represent any particular um, topic on the table uh, uh, more faithfully or fairly because both sides are lending to discussion it's kind of what wikipedia does it it brings uh, lots of uh, perspectives into the same uh, discussion so that we can see uh, a lot of the strings right there in one place so we're going to begin to look at psalm 110 as seen through the lens of wikipedia starting next week but that'll do it for a trinitarian response to biblical unitarianism